Okay. All well, right. So. Okay. Yeah, go for it. So you, can play. <laughs> no, go ahead. you go ahead. No, no, no. I can hear. How rude of me to interrupt, please. I insist. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> so, welcome everybody to the Philosophy Club meeting. Our topic today is science and ethics. And so basically, we're going to be looking at questions like, when has science gone too far? Can science go too far in terms of things like maybe genetics and how we can mess around with that, how people are born, even cloning, things of that nature. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Are you yeah. drawing a line at eugenics? No, I'm drawing no lines here. <laughs> All righty. Anybody want to start us off? I just did. Go. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, I'll throw something out there too. Um, again, I, I like this topic. I think you're right. I think this could be a, a really engaging, fun topic because, like, a lot of it hinges on what we understand science's purpose to be. I, I mean, what? Why study science? And I think if you ask students that, they're like, "It's a burgeoning field. You know, it's 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 maybe a lucrative uh, career field, but it's like." Okay, instead of saying why study science, why science? Like, why is there science? Where did it come from? And, you know, you look at modern day science, um, you know, I, I, I teach this to students in some classes. I think it starts, you know, in the 1600s with the rise of the Enlightenment and the understanding that, um, well, there's physical evidence based reasons to believe things that maybe aren't necessarily as verifiable. You know, when it comes to faith-based play. So the idea seems to be that, I'll make a long story short, the idea seems to be that if we can learn nature, uh, uh, again, if we can learn the laws of nature, physics, science, then we can, uh, we can master them. We, we, can come, we can figure out how to contain them and manipulate them for our own interest. And that's kind of what science has done. If you look at, again, medicinal science, it's just figuring out what causes the body to decay and die and then trying to you know, uh, keep that from happening as uh, rapidly as it normally would. You look at psychology and, and, and you know, more uh, pharmaceutical-based sciences where the idea is if you're unwell due to something like chemical imbalance or, or maybe genetics, you can um, put yourself on this sort of uh, right chemical cocktail to, to, for your benefit, which, you know, without the help of science, you wouldn't be able to do that. So you look at that, you look at technology as the other main branch of science. It's like, yeah, technology right now is serving our means, um, or rather serving our ends as a means of convenience. So technological advancements means now things are really easy, more convenient, less risky, less of a chance of us hurting ourselves. So, yeah, I, I, I would like to kind of throw it out there in that sense. Um, science, the purpose of science seems to be not knowing the world for its own sake and the beauty of knowledge and truth. It's learning the truth for the sake of applying it towards human interest. <laughs> Hmm. Agreed. That was very well put. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, going off of that, you know, science and what I guess what we're really looking for here in this question, then, you know, morale and uh, or morals and uh, science is how far do they push or what can they do and still be okay with getting away within the attempt to do that, which you've explained? Like, what are they allowed to do? in yeah. their attempt to do that. Um, it's like, imagine if they found the, uh, the elixir to like everlasting life, but to attain it, you had to like, like uh, murder someone else. It's like, is it like, would science attempt it? Would scientists attempt that? And would they seek to do it, even though it's such a horrible thing? but to them it's science. Well, I think in, in this instance, it's important to kind of see the connection between science and ethics. Um, in my own opinion, I kind of feel like ethics or rather like our, some, even some religious constitutions, constitution, institutions, um, in some ways are kind of based by, by science. Not science in the notion of, of the way we understand it, the scientific method, but instead our surroundings, our nature. Um, because when you look at what maybe even religions were, what they're kind of just trying to give an understanding of what was around us, but not having the same kind of method as science, not having that same kind of observational uh, facts. So, so when you really look at the connection, I feel like in some ways, or maybe indirect or directly, 
our ethics is com is is uh, affected by our understanding of science. If we look at the world and we say, oh, well, you know what? Life is meaningless and humans don't really matter. So I don't really care if I kill people. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of affected by our understanding of science. Does ethics inform science or does science inform ethics though? The way you put that, I'm not sure. I'd say science informs ethics. Yeah, I think okay, so scientists, <laughs> scientists sit before review board, ethical review boards for some of their studies. Yeah, well, but, but you have to remember that the, instant, the Institutional Review Board wasn't established until 1973, and before then, some of the experiments that, you know, people put other people through were terrible. Like, even in psychology alone, I don't know about anything else, but, like, mm -hmm. psychology put, through, put people through a lot until someone finally stepped in and said, hey, you can't do that. And back then, they didn't care because it was in the name of trying to prove, you know, Right. It's but I would argue that I would argue yeah. that's still happening. Yeah, even with the ethics review board. Probably. I mean, I think that still always happens. I mean, I think one or other has to override each other. Like you either you know care more about the ethics of what you're doing, or you care more about the results. Yeah, and uh, I believe you show you're gonna you're next here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, based based off of that that whole conversation, I think um, science is just a, I guess, an advancement factor in comparison to ethics, where yeah. ethics kind of weighs us down, and science makes sure we progress. Because just last week, I want to say I was watching this movie on Netflix called The Physician. I'll leave it in the chat box as well if anyone wants to see it. But in that movie, the entire dilemma is that up until that point in history or whatever they're trying to portray, there hadn't been uh, an open body surgery. I mean, the human body was never open. People were just going off of assumptions. And this kid comes in, he opens up a dead body. So everyone thinks, oh my God, it's a big no-no. So even with eugenics today, uh, someone needs to come in and perform it to properly understand, um, I guess, the usage of it. So I think ethics is something that holds us down, not, to, not necessarily in a bad way, but in my opinion, it's it's definitely a setback in comparison to the open field and the freedom of advancement that science can offer. Well, well, maybe it's not always. I mean, I, I see definitely what you're saying there. Like, it can definitely be a setback. But maybe it's not always a setback. Maybe in some ways, it's kind of it's trying to provide wisdom to the knowledge that we have, because if we go about using science and we use it in a way that's kind of irresponsible and we don't take precaution, then we can wind up in like in a really bad situation. But ethics in that sense can kind of be this sort of precaution in, in terms of just how it'll affect humanity. Uh, Pleasant, you're next. Oh, I'm sorry, it would have mute. Um, so basically what I think is just a different um, point of view to what you guys were saying. I think Yes, it could be about what um, Professor Manzi had said, but um, I feel like it results into us appreciating the, or believing more into the sacred because science doesn't explain everything. And there's some mysteries that are left unrevealed or unexplained. And I feel like science makes me at least appreciate and know that there could actually be the sacred, something that is bigger than it. Yeah. Well, I just uh, have one thing to say about that. I, I kind of agree with what you're saying. They're kind of like, maybe there's a spiritual aspect that is a little bit difficult for science to kind of understand. But I think in, in terms of science, I, I don't really see this, like, this sort of kind of barrier that's put on it. Because science isn't saying that it's exploring why we are here, our purpose. It's more of an, it's trying to understand are are like the mechanics of our, our nature you know it's like if there isn't something if there's something in science that isn't isn't understood there is going to be an advancement to understand it better and better although we don't have it yet uh i believe ishra's next
Isra. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> um, okay, so I believe um, with ethics, like from Yusha's argument, what come to, it comes to my mind regarding ethics and science is the fact that um, how far do we want it to go in terms of our curiosity? Because um, I've, I've seen the movie with him and the whole portrayal of the character is simply his fascination with um, science and the human anatomy because he, he didn't understand it and he was willing to go to any lengths it took to understand uh, the human body. And um, at the time that when it was portrayed or the, the timeline where um, people were more religious regardless of being Muslim, um, Christian, Jew or whatever, uh, mutilating a body was always uh, considered um, a wrong and uh, an act of uh, evil. Where how of how would you be opening up a human body, even if it is to look inside, or even if it is to fix a disease? There was no such thing. There were some ailments that were always um, like the side sickness. That um, I don't know what it's called, but it's basically appendicitis. Appendix what appendicitis. Yes, that one. So um, that is an operable disease. That is something that could be operated and you'd be back to health in no time. But at that time, mutilating a body was considered a sin. And people were God-fearing in terms that they didn't want to, there were some lines that they didn't think should be crossed. So um, testing those limits is like, what I'm trying to make a point is, is that um, testing the limits is a very fine line in terms of where is it ethically or mor morally wrong and where is it necessary for us to cross those lines and say that, okay, this is something that needs to be done because it's in the better interest of people. For example, um, last time we, were, we kind of sort of touched on uh, genetic manipulation and how people would be, um, sh is it even ethical for us to be genetically um, um, manipulating our babies or, um, any other thing that we might be doing when it comes to human babies and human test subjects. So um, in those terms, I think it's more so about how fine the line is and where is the line drawn in terms of where everyone says that, oh no, the hands off of that one, that's completely off the charts, it's not allowed, or this, this, and this is the reason it's considered wrong. And then additionally, the question arises, who's the, dictating authority in terms of telling us in in the realm of like what's right and wrong when it comes to science you know yeah yeah um i mean i'll throw something out there it kind of goes back to what i was uh getting at too like you know the way that we can sort of develop some sort of standard of judgment upon the limits or the uh the limits of sort of certain liberties you can take in experimenting it kind of begs the question, well, why are we experimenting? You know, why, you know, why these scientific um, investigations at all? And, you know, again, going back to this idea of um, how science can help us learn about ethics, I, I mean, thanks to science and scientific advancements, you could say now we know a lot about pain. We know what causes pain. We, we, we know, and obviously I think we could agree that pain is generally speaking unpleasant or something that you do not want to experience. So we know how to treat it, we know what causes it, we can anticipate what might cause it. And part of that has to do with looking inside the human body. Um, again, this idea of uh, dissecting, I suppose, for the sake of avoiding pain for those who maybe are still living, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so again, if science is for the sake of mastering the, the laws of physical nature, that involves investigating the physical. <laughs> physical bodies. Um, and so how does that help ethics and morality? I mean, if you could have a more precise understanding of the ways in which people might suffer, then you'll, have, you'll be much more equipped to keep people from suffering in those ways. Yeah. But again, at what cost? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a good point. And I think it's also important the way we're kind of defining ethics. You know, if we're looking at ethics as what is the betterment or what's better for all people, I mean, well, let's look at science even and say, well, is it necessarily good that we prolong our life, like our life expend expectancy? Isn't it in some way kind of selfish for the next generation that maybe we're taking up resources that we shouldn't take? Aren't we kind of prolonging death and, f and facing something that is mortal? Yes. Is, couldn't you say that's also something that we should take into consideration? Very well said, Orlando. Yes, absolutely. 
It's like, because as we or we as like imperfect creatures, should we have, you know, this gift of like immortality? Do we want humans to be living forever? Like, cause then imagine that's like, imagine if we found, you know, a way to make everyone live forever and we suddenly did it for everyone across the all, uh, across the board, just, just for the sake of keeping humans alive. But then like, there'd be a lot of bad people out there living forever, you know? Um, or even worse, like the, pot the potential for good people to turn bad in their, you know, endless lifetime, you know, so is that such a good thing? You know, if we can't even perfect ourselves, is it worth trying to perfect like mortality? You know, maybe we're meant to die since we're so sinful anyway or something, you know? <laughs> hey, hey, Ryan. Uh, oh, he's not in yet. But I was, I was a little reluctant. I was a little reluctant to let you in because of the name, but uh. <laughs> you see how quiet that is? Yeah. You can choose if you want it on iPhone or speaker. Obviously. Okay. That. Okay. So sorry. Is, so you, once you you're right. You're, right. you're, 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 now, yeah. you're not muted. They can hear everything. Yeah, we can hear you. I think <laughs> completely. Um, I, gotcha. I think you can flip it too. I don't you know can how see, you can see all of the other students like this. Oh God. <laughs> 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 Like here. Oh, All right, Ryan, I'm going to mute you because uh, there we go. <laughs> All right, mom. Um, okay. What was the last thing we were saying? I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, I just I, I wanted to piggyback on on, uh, on on Marcus's point there that um, again, it's it's like this. You know, you can flip it and say, well, how much faith do you want to have in science? So if if science is is constantly yielding results, like we're we're learning how to um, you know, ward off against appendicitis. Uh, and so that's generally helping people who otherwise would die from it. I mean, if we have the actual tangible results, then we have more of a reason to, to be, um, how to put this, optimistic that not only will we become scientifically knowledgeable about the laws of nature, but we can become just as knowledgeable about things like justice. So even if people do start to live longer and longer, we'll have a better understanding of how to sort of, uh, I suppose, place people, evaluate people in terms of their um, contribution to society, or rather um, they're not taking away from society by avoiding criminal behavior. Well, uh, so, so political science in other words. I'm kind of curious, Mizzy, can you ever really make a concrete connection between uh, morality and science? Because it's, it seems to me like one is subjective and the other in some sense is, ob is objective, so. Yeah, you have, you have the facts on the one hand, and then you have to decide how to value them. And that's what that morality is evaluating. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, again, you have to look at where science is coming from. It's coming from human beings. It's coming from human beings who don't like to suffer, don't like to feel pain, don't like to die, don't like to be inconvenient. So we're focusing our scientific energies, it seems to me at least, on precisely sort of dealing with those issues that are very much human issues. So I think you're right, Orlando. I, I don't think you can make a very clear connection between the two unless you want to claim something like the world was made a certain way in a certain image after a certain God that makes value somehow as real as natural facts. But if you don't see it like that, then yeah, I think you're right. It, it comes down to a matter of how do humans value the facts that science uh, it kind of brings forward. Wisdom. Yeah, exactly. It's how do how do we, can we carry the responsibility of the knowledge that science gives us? Is 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 how I like to look at it. You know, because the more we understand, the more we weaponize science, the more tools we have at our disposal to use for either good or bad. And so we're either going to end up, you know, weaponizing ourselves to destruction or being able to handle whatever we throw at ourselves by, you know, being responsible. It's like, you know, the creation of the nuclear bomb has given the whole world a new responsibility in terms of, you know, where is the point of yield, you know, for such a thing? Um, because if everyone suddenly started popping them off all at once, you know, as many movies have displayed, you know, spectacularly on the big screen, but um, it's, it's, it's a fine, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to handle it personally, you know, what, what do y'all think, you know, is that, what do y'all think, like, are we, are we naturally 
responsible for whatever we come up with you know with all these phones and this technology that we have are we responsibly giving this information to the ever-growing population do you believe also i mean i kind of think that um in this conversation we're kind of, we can kind of get at the idea of like utilitarianism versus kind of individualism you know like i will, uh, should we sacrifice people for the betterment of others or should we should it come as, at a cost you know or is it that everyone's life should be valued equally in that sense um, but uh, let's see. I think Ishra, you're next. Okay. Um, so about the imm immortality thing and the justice thing, that kind of reminded me of another movie. Again, I don't know if that's the name, but it's called uh, Aeon Flux, or the main character basically was um, <laughs> Aeon Flux. Essentially, they, they, there was this like disease or something happened where humans couldn't, it wasn't considered safe for humans to be having babies. So what they did was uh, their alternative to imm immortality was that um, the same people who um, were alive when this whole pandemic thing happened, um, people kind of just were genetic, were made genetic copies of themselves and the same status where they'd be living, for example, the rich would remain rich, the poor was still poor, and they would just keep living that way without knowing how long have they lived. So um, presumptuously, they would die, and then the same people who died, they'd come back to life. So um, when it comes to immortality, I feel like um, humans are given a little bit too much credit in terms of understanding that, oh, um, being immortal means that we we have an opportunity to improve the society. Um, I feel like humans would generally just say that, oh, if I found a way to be immortal, I the first thing I want to go after is power and make sure that I remain in power, despite um, the fact that maybe there's someone else who can do a better job than I can, or despite the fact that there are others who might work well with me, should I not be the only one in power? You know, so um, I that's what that comes to mind when when we talk about immortality and justice, especially when it comes to uh, humans and um, how we may perceive uh, that, oh, I can live forever. That gives me a free reign of doing whatever it is I please. And um, since I do, I am living forever. Yes, the punishment like when it, uh, the punishments that are more so like for life, those seem more um I would argue cruel at this point um, in terms of like, if you're immortal, you're forever going to remain in jail or you're forever mm -hmm. going to remain in, you know, punishment or whatever. But right. um, that's, that's my take in terms of when we say that, oh, okay, how far do we want to push our science for us to be able to become immortal? Another point that arose was the fact that um, previously, for example, appendicitis were I'm, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but I, I'm sure everyone understands what I'm saying. Um, that disease was considered a deadly disease, as is cancer right now. By removal of the disease, we effectively learned how to extend a human being's life who's inflicted by such a disease. Similarly, cancer at this moment has no cure, most types of cancer. So if we are to figure out um, that that um, thing that we can cure that kind of, you know, causes our death, does that effectively mean that we're a step closer to immortality as in terms of extending human life? What if death is a disease and we're able to find an effective cure for it? Would that make us immortal or would we have the tools or the means necessary to become immortal at that point? So... I think that's very interesting way you put it in the perspective of immortality. I, I also think just to kind of add on to what you're saying, because you brought up an interesting question. Um, wouldn't the, wouldn't us obtaining immortality kind of change our, our nature in a sense or our, our ethical nature? Because you know, I actually want to talk about it, but I don't know if I'm next. So I'm just waiting for my, I think you should next. I'm sorry. Uh, and then you can go next, but I just wanted to say this one thing. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. but the thing that I'm saying is that like, um, if we are to obtain immortality, wouldn't that change our nature completely? Because if you think of concepts of power or of concepts of me wanting more than others, isn't that based on this idea of limited resources? But if we're being faced with immortality and being faced with these, these ways to manipulate nature, then would we still see the world in the same way? I'm not sure. Uh, Yusha, I believe you're next. 
Thank you. Uh, Ferdinando, I'll keep it short, maybe like a couple minutes. Uh, to that, Orlando, to your question, I think I would say uh, that no, not necessarily. Our natures would not change because there is a series on Netflix. I think it's called Altered Carbon. And it's rated R. I didn't necessarily watch it all the way through, but I got the concept that humans were immortal and they still sought out power and way to live longer so that's i guess that that would be the thing that even after immortality humans would still go after power and i th i would say that ethics brings in um it draws in the line between how far we can take science like if we look at it during world war uh, nukes were invented and they had to be tested somewhere people had to lose lives again it's science and ethics because if the u.s had not tested on those people the usa would not have been able to drop it on hiroshima and nagasaki and after that vaccines we have so many vaccines like polio malaria and so much harmful stuff that generations nowadays they don't even know what that is because they get the vaccine when they're like a couple months old again that's on that's on research of science and then the ethics of the committee to whether to have it tested or not i'm pretty sure in the testing a lot of lives were lost a lot of people were badly uh i guess hurt by it but at the end of the day, we got something that's useful. So why not genetic modification? What's keeping us from that? I feel like it's, it's still being used as a pawn to, uh, to still gather up power. And that's where the ethics of that science comes in. Because scientists are already working on it. They're being forced by governments not to work on it. Because if genetic modification is achieved, people would be smarter, healthier, stronger, and better than they are right now. So then those new generation of people will be able to challenge the ones that are already in power. And I think that's, that's why we need ethics to draw the line between science and uh, uh, how far we can take it. I like that point. Yeah. Well put. Um, so Ferdinando, you're next, but just so you guys know, it's counting me down for like five minutes. So if it cuts out, just rejoin the meeting. <laughs> I just rejoined the meeting. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, well, actually, in my perspective, I do feel like it will change how we perceive the world, like, largely. Because part of our motivation really is kind of like to experience as much as we can since life is, like, it has an end. But if you remove that block, uh, I feel like a lot of people are, like, not necessarily have to go through power. They can just maybe lose even the sense of their existence because you have time to do everything. So what is the rush? Mm -hmm. so you can just maybe just take your time to do something. Like I, I believe that uh, a lot of the motivation can even go away. Uh, and even like if, 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 for example, if you manage to be the only one immortal, like that also affects how you connect with other people because you realize that their life is going to end, but you're going to continue. So that also can limit how you connect with others because the idea that, yeah, everyone is going to disappear and there's going to be probably a moment in which I'm the only one standing. Like that idea can actually even like, kind of like reconstruct your thoughts of like, what is the sense for me to actually be more to like, like I, I don't feel like really it's going to provide too much of a benefit except for the fact that you get to see things that are going to be happening at the, at the future. Um, hmm. But uh, I don't, like, I think that that idea is really, uh, it, it, it comes with a consequence that I don't think many people are kind of explore. People are, like, usually are afraid to, to die and they want to know as much as they can, but not because you are immortal means that you're going to have access to that information necessarily. And neither that you're going to be able to have access to all the power that you can because it's not like society is, oh, yeah, he's immortal. Just give him everything, you know. So it, it, it's, it's a very interesting um, 
thing that I'm not completely sure if if advarks everything that we're trying to talk uh, for this meeting. But for sure, I do believe that when it comes to like the psychic of the person, it has to reconstruct the whole thing because. I mean, even like if you love someone, you know that that someone is going to die. And it's like, it, it, you just disappear for the whole thing. Like if you have kids, those kids are going to die as well. So it, it's just, it, it is a lot that comes with being immortal. Um, but yeah. anyways, we have two minutes. Yeah, let me just throw this out here too real quick before we go to, to add on to that. Yeah, I, I mean, this is why, this hasn't really come up in, in our discussion, which is totally fine. But um Sometimes there's a bit of antagonism between um, maybe religion and science. Maybe, you know, you hear about it or you get the sense there is. I mean, this is kind of, you're getting at the heart of it. Because, you know, you, you, I, I think we're kind of more or less realizing that the goal of science, and this was the expressed goal by Rene Descartes, again, back in the 1600s, is to try to figure out how to live forever. It's try, to try to be um, immortal. But the understanding that you're not just living forever in this world, that the world is constantly going to become better and better because science is constantly learning more and more. So it's not, it's not just like you're, you're, you're stuck here. Things are going to improve, which is a good thing, which is why you want to stick around. But, but the other side of it is that people who are you know, certain, of a certain faith or denomination, they, they don't want to live here forever. They want to ascend to the next stage, so to speak. They're not trying to be, to, to be immortal would be to go against God's will. So this is why you have this, the, the very heart of scientific advancement itself seems to, at least on the surface, be at odds with, I would say, with the fundamental underlying tenet of most, if not all, religions. Just so we get an idea of why there is an antagonist. Not, not saying it's completely justified. But it has to do with stuff that Fernando was saying. Well, um, I'm going to let this last minute kind of ride out here because I, I don't want someone to speak and then they get cut off. All right. <laughs> I, I can just speak. Yeah, until it cuts, it cuts off. It's all right. So I can try <laughs> to see if there is a joke. Let me see if I have a joke. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's okay. Have any of you guys seen The Good Place? Yeah. It's, okay. it's actually a very good series. It is. It is a very good series. I think I think it falls off after season one, personally. <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of skipped around. It gets yeah. a little wacky. Season one is pretty solid. <laughs> but, but okay, we're back. Let's let everybody back in real quick. So okay. what's the gist of the good place? I've heard, I've heard of it. I've seen like a uh, link about the, it, but I haven't. The, the, the thing is that if we actually tell you, we can spoil something. And the <laughs> magic of the series is to not spoil you. It's uh, very that's specific. The thing. I don't part. have the time. Engage it's, about, it's about kind of like but, heaven and hell and like, um, it just takes a stance on a lot of like philosophical topics. Mm -hmm. Bust a lot. So if you like philosophy, I think it's going to be very interesting. But it's also a show I don't think you have to watch. Yeah, I think I think my favorite my favorite part of that show is how strong they make the philosophy professor's character. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, it really reflects really well with people in my profession. <laughs> no, but it, it is so funny how many series has been popping up today. Like <laughs> you just saw the chat, it was like a lot of serious all right well um, to be fair we have nothing else to do so <laughs> we have a lot of things to do we always no have you have a lot of things to do most other people would rather sit and watch tv finish their assignments and then back to tv i also do assignments excuse me right right mancy right you see yeah mancy's i do my that yeah. proves nothing. <laughs> it proves how that long, everyone can okay, um, I might be willing to give the show a shot. Um, how long is each episode? I believe and how many 20. seasons or how many episodes are there? A hundred seasons. All right, let's, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> um, it's an overrated show. No, no offense for you. <laughs> no, no, that's true. I'll take Professor Manzi's word for it. 
<laughs> he likes the first season, and the first season is the one that you need to watch. I used to, I used to uh, in my ethics class for Tuna, actually, the class that you're taking right now, I used to offer that as an extra credit assignment. You could analyze season one of, uh, of um, The Good Place with um, the authors that we study. But uh, th then, then I think something happened where you couldn't watch it for free anymore, so then I was like, well, I can't offer this because... Oh, so yeah. Yeah, it's on Netflix now. But it... Um, I don't want to spoil anything, but in the last season, essentially, they kind of tackle the topic of um, death in a sense, like you know, death of the spirit, mm -hmm. like absolute death, you know, beyond. Everyone dies, Fortuna. We we'll spoil it. What? No, 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 no. <laughs> Trust me, that's not. That's not even. It's not an important aspect of the fourth season, anyways. Oh. But I think the conclusion that they come to is like death gives life money. I I definitely agree with that, and I think like you can kind of look at people of older generations and they some of them are ready to go like <laughs> speaking, some of them are like yeah i'm i'm ready to go i just want to say my goodbyes and i want people to say goodbye to me and i'm i'm ready to you know move on so i definitely think like without the the without the prospect of dying like you know not knowing or knowing that our days are limited and you know i think it kind of drives us and motivates us to to live our lives fully and I also don't necessarily think that like death is something to be avoided. Um, like, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't think, I don't think, I think if someone else wants to um, pursue immortality, that's up to them. That's their prerogative. I personally don't think I would. Um, and yeah, I think, I think there can, it can be problematic in the sense that people who are rich and of higher socioeconomic status are going to be probably the first ones in the running to get immortality. So I think that's kind of, in that case, we're kind of picking who lives and who dies. Yeah. In a sense. <laughs> I think that, I think you made a really good point there to say like, uh, to put that death is kind of a part of our, our nature, you know, because like, I think for the I'm not sure if you put it like that, but you said that uh, it's kind of, you're trying to do everything you can in this limited, limited amount of time. But here's the thing, I feel like maybe that's just a, a perspective that we still have yet to reach. You know, if we were to reach it, would we necessarily feel that way about immortality? Because let's take maybe like the idea of aliens, for example. If aliens exist and they're in a sense immortal, could we say, could they have a complete different nature or different perspective of life than we do? Well, I think, I think like scientifically speaking, novelty in our lives kind of extends it. That's why whenever you're younger, time seems to pass by a lot more slowly than when you're older and eventually if you're live for long enough that novelty is going to kind of go away so i think in that aspect for sure there's not going to be that much as much to live for you know if you've done everything that you wanted to do i feel like it's kind of like rewatching the same show over and over again you know to a certain point you just kind of get tired of it well yeah, here's the thing though um i guess depending on kind of what you what you believe in as to what happens when you die if we move on to maybe perhaps another plane, another afterlife, then do we really cease to exist if we're just transitioning to somewhere else? Or are we just dead in our natural world? Um, I don't have a, a <laughs> opinion on that. That's a very deep question. That kind of takes me to the existential crisis, so I try not to think about that. Um, I'll worry about it when, when the day comes. <laughs> but that's the case, like, if, if like I guess if you believe in the spirit actually like if I may say something I have a friend who said that the only reason why he's so scared about dying is of the idea that he ceased to exist like if yeah. there is something in in like if there is something that says that after you die you may do something else he will be okay but the idea but he's not a believer of uh, religion mm -hmm. so he just say like I feel like once I die it's just gonna be dark and that idea is it scares him like a lot so so here's the thing you know i feel like when talking about death people often think oh what happens when i'm dead but they never think about well where was i before i existed you know i, I it, think it the I same think, way i think i don't i don't really believe in like an afterlife personally i think whenever we die we just die so i think that's that's definitely scary to me so whenever whenever I say like death gives life meaning, that's kind of what I'm speaking on. Like it gives my life meaning because I don't think going back to how I was before I was born, it's just a, a place where I'd never existed. Kind of like going to sleep. You're not really conscious of your existence and you just don't exist. And that, that is actually not something to be afraid of in my opinion. But um, 
I guess, I don't know. I don't know, because there's a philosopher, I forgot his name, but he kind of talks about death and like how it's not something we should be afraid of. It's not painful. It's not bad. We, we just simply don't really feel it, I guess, unless you believe in afterlife. Yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of interesting takes on that in terms of like even the idea of consciousness and how that kind of fits into mm -hmm. to the wide, wider spectrum of reality. Um, but wait, let me see. I think Yusha, you're next. But if you don't mind, I kind of want to let Ryan go because he hasn't talked yet. So I think Serena's trying to talk to Oh, sorry. Okay. Did she raise her hand? I don't even know. Yeah, she raised her hand. Okay. Well, here, let's do this. Go ahead, Ryan and Serena. Go ahead. Uh, I'll just wait because I have uh, I have stuff written down, so I'm not gonna forget it. So take take your time. Okay, Serena, you can go, and then then Ryan, you can go. Well, I mean, wouldn't you think that you know the idea of like an afterlife, you know, is presented to people as like a form of immortality? Because I mean, in a sense, it's like you're reassuring people, to, like I know you're scared of death, but it's heaven there's an afterlife you do live forever so i mean here is your Im immortality like in a you know morality exactly. yeah no i completely agree but also like even looking at the idea of we become nothingness well then at one point you could argue we were nothing and so if if we were there already what's necessarily so bad about it what's necessarily so scary about it it's um, because now you've tasted somethingness but you don't want to go back to nothing. But here's the thing. I like I, I never really share this with people because they, they think I'm kind of a wacko when I say this. But <laughs> I, I like to think wacko. that I kind of remember what it was like before I was born. It's kind of weird to say that. But I have, I don't know if it was just a dream or something, some kind of experience. But I remember feeling like this idea where it's just dark. But I felt kind of warmth. And I didn't necessarily feel scared. It kind of felt like home. But when I was born, rather, it kind of felt like pain and I felt sensation and I felt, wow, this is kind of scary. And I feel like in the long run of life, that's how, that's kind of what we, we come to is that we're, we're kind of forced to feel, we're kind of forced to confront these conflicts and adversity. And that is much more painful than the idea of not existing at all. So mm -hmm. when you're looking at that, well, how exactly is that scary? Well, it's scary. Well, mm -hmm. so, I mean, we build this life and yeah we, we were confronted with a lot of scary ups and downs but at the end of the day no one wants to die no one wants to lose this life and so when confronted with the aspect of death and eventually losing it one day I mean we're all terrified well I think I remember this interesting quote I'm sorry guys for kind of dictating this but I remember this interesting quote that said like if man was to to garner the power of God he would create chaos because he would be so bored of having the power of God and having everything to be perfect that he'd get so tired of it. And I think that's maybe how it would be to be immortal is that if, you ha if you're never dying, if you're always just, everything's at your will, what's the point? Um, okay, so, sorry guys, uh, who's next? Uh, Ryan, you're next. Does he know how to mute? Ryan, Ryan, let me un let me unmute you. Let me unmute you. Yeah. Ryan, can you check if you're on mute? He's on mute. I'm trying to unmute him. It doesn't let me. Huh? There. There, there you go. go. Oh my god. Welcome. How do I do this? Hello. What am I doing? What's this? We can hear you now. And he is off. <laughs> okay. Wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you can go, Yusha. Uh, for now, I guess he he he, ag he agreed to let you speak. He just left. <laughs> I guess. Thanks, Ryan. I guess. Um, talking about. It's new to Zoom, so I just not know how to use it. Okay, no, yeah, no, coming no. back. I'll let him <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, it's okay. Talking about like um death and huh? what's after, especially when it comes to philosophy i think it's i'm not i'm not treading on anyone's religion i am very religious myself so i know when i say this and i do apologize if i end up offending anyone but to me the idea of um like having an afterlife or a reincarnation or something like that it it kind of seems like 
almost too good to be true uh, in a sense. But at the same talking, uh, I personally am not scared of dying because uh, as Orlando mentioned, like when most people don't remember from before being born, they how 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 are they certain that it's not going to be the same after they die in a sense like the only conscious thing about them would be the the time period where they lived on earth but not after or before so i guess it it doesn't have to be as scary because in like hindu uh religion they believe that you get reincarnated like some seven times if you do good deeds you are human if you do bad deeds you're like cat dog cockroach and some insect or whatever uh same not the same but kind of similar with uh, judaism christianity and um yeah that's a very small part i'm not sure who that is i can't see your name but it's, it's a ryan. very small part that's ryan, yeah. that's ryan. all right uh it, it is a very small part it's not the entire religion don't get me wrong on that i am no by no means an expert on it, but that's from what I've heard from my friends who are uh, practicing that religion. Uh, it's similar in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, where after you die, you're resurrect resurrected for, your, for the judgment day, so on and so forth. But I don't think that, uh, I, I, I just think it's too good to be true. And uh, I think someone had mentioned that people are scared to die. Uh, let me it's not Serena. No, yes, me. I don't know. I can't remember who mentioned it, but someone said that people are uh, people are scared to die. And I've I've met really, really a lot of people. Uh, most of them, again, being uh, very spiritual and having a strong connection with their religion, they they don't fear death per se. They say that okay. And it's just the next phase in our existence. So I think they don't think the philosophy of of existing, uh, from from my understanding. But that that's just me. Uh, hey Ryan, you want to turn your mic? I'm gonna hand the floor to you. Uh, yeah, let Ryan talk real quick. Who? You. My fan on? Oh my god, it is. Can y'all hear my fan? No. No, we can't. Thank God. Okay, what were we on about? We're all, we're all your fans, Ryan. <laughs> uh, science. Science and, um, and ethics. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to go over, and I do not have a lot of time anymore. Uh, I have... Uh, well, let me, th let me throw something at you real quick and, and see like, uh, if you can say something to it. Please, um, God, I've given up. No, it's all good. I, uh, and I want to hear, hear you chime in on something. So, again, it's like this. Uh, you know, we talked about the, the relationship between what science uh, purports to be factual, evidence-based, and then values, which seem to be maybe more subjective. Uh, the question, the overlap, I should say, to the, the topic is this, that, you know, okay, so we have these scientific findings. Um, what do we do with them, and how do we go about ethically conducting our, our research? Uh, it, it would seem to be that the, you know, the degree to which you value scientific evidence is going to be the degree to which you understand what death is supposed to be, what, you, what, what it's supposed to represent. Um, because again, you have to ask yourself, why do science at all? And here's the answer. Science itself as an enterprise came from a very value-based society. People realize pain sucks. <laughs> Pleasure is better. So let's figure out a way to avoid pain. I, I mean, that was a value judgment that gave rise to quote unquote objective science. So uh, again, if, if the source of science itself is, is value, then certainly ethics and morality has an important role to play because it's always, we talk about fact checking, it's always value checking the facts rather than fact checking the values, if that makes sense. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Um, next week. No, I'm joking. Hey, Ryan, you still there? Or still no? there. Huh? Are you still there, man? Oh, uh, yeah. 
Okay. I mean, what do you think? Um, do you think that science, uh, there should be moral limits put on, on science? That depends on everything involved in whatever scientific discovery or actions people may take. I was more focused on the whole death aspect because I have so much respect for death because I have so much respect for life. It is a big cycle to me. And if you fear death, don't question mark question mark i don't really necessarily fear death or the ideas of what might come after because i well for one i just don't necessarily care two i uh, i'm trying to con I, I, i'm like I, I have like nothing but trixie mattel stuck in my brain right now thanks to youtube i'm trying to convey thoughts i cannot I'm do that well, no, nonetheless, uh, I think you're, the point you're making is one that other people have kind of um, touched upon. So you're in good company. This idea of, uh, you know, death may not necessarily be um, the be-all, end-all. Death just, is a I, natural part of life. Just think about what science has done up to this point. Everything has been, it, it's operated in a way that isn't beholden to any particular set of religious values. It's, it, its values are humanitarian, and that's what science would say. So, for example, science you know, ha has brought us to the point where we can have quadruple bypass surgery. It's brought us to the point where we can have like funerals. It's brought us to the point where we can have smooth abortions. Uh, um, science, when I serves all, science serves all of these things. When I decided to bring up this topic, I figured I wanted to understand, my, my main goal and like trying to understand how far science should, should go is the idea of eugenics. Now I understand eugenics has a notorious reputation for being um synonymous with nazism fascism racism all that crap because that's what they kind of the end goal was to make just all white aryan supreme whatever the hell uh i'm more along the lines of what if we just got rid of down syndrome or birth defects or like messed up chromosomes or things like that like yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to understand. Like, what if instead of it, like if we could keep someone from being born with horrible disfigurements or horrible genetic uh, birth defects, diseases, whatever the hell may come, they they might have. Uh, what if we stop that? Is that okay? Is that morally acceptable? At least in an American society. Because I, for one, would think, kind of, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it really just depends on, on your own kind of culture and how you see death. Like, once again, if you feel like death isn't necessarily a bad thing, prolonging life in some ways can be seen as bad. Well, look, uh, I want to die, but that's, not, that's neither here nor there. So, we, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, um, I saw... so just so you guys know, we are kind of getting towards the end of our meeting, so let's kind of try to be brief here. Yeah, do you want to, you want to do last thoughts or something? Yeah, we can do that. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you want to go ahead and finish up here? Do your final thoughts? Ryan? Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Christina, I believe you are next, so you can give your final thoughts. Um, so I figured out what the um, philosopher's name was. His name is Epicurus, and he was a hedonist philosopher in ancient Egypt, and he wrote um, this letter to Menosius. I don't know how to pronounce that, but it basically he talks about how um, the state of being dead is meaningless, and humans who have like an irrational fear of death can't live their lives to the fullest. So I think that's kind of another angle to look at it. Not even necessarily that death gives life meaning, but having a fear of death and having that constantly at the forefront of your mind can definitely like inhibit your ability to live your life to the fullest. And also um, being dead is, I don't know, like be, the state of being dead is not really a, of concern to someone who is dead, right? So like someone who is dead isn't going to care that they're dead. But and I'm as saying. far as where my religion goes or where my like beliefs go, they're not really going to be conscious of their death, death either. So I think like death is really only something that affects the living. And we kind of, um, you know, shouldn't really be afraid of that. That being said, when you search up Epicurus, he actually died of a kidney stone. So it's kind of funny. It's like, well, if he were living in this day and age, or if, if we went back in time and told him, hey, 
we can fix you with science. We can cure yeah. you. But you're the one saying that you shouldn't be afraid of death. What do you want to do? So it's kind of interesting to see how people back then would react who are writing um, these papers would react to um, to the prospect of extending their lives, you know? Yeah, sure. Really good point. Um, John, you can go ahead and give your final thoughts to your next. Oh, let me know. You can skip me, dude. Okay, that's, that's fine. Well, um, this kind of, all this discussion about like immortality and science, we, we, yes, we touched a lot on science, but I don't think we actually got to the core of it in terms of human meddling and how far is far enough. We kind of uh, redirected the conversation more so on death and immortality, which <laughs> kind of sprung another question, if I'm okay to ask the, the question, like suggestion for next week, uh, is that if we are truly immortal or if we do truly become immortal, would racism cease to exist? And would the world be a better place if caste and religion ceased uh, to exist or if it ceased to become the root cause of um, most conflicts with uh, humanity? Interesting. So it could kind of be like the morality of immortality, maybe? Mm -hmm. It's just a formality. <laughs> Wait, they said that was a topic from our class. Yeah, yeah. Which one? It was from one of the small circles. Socratic circles, yes. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's a good topic. I, I like that topic. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's do some topic suggestions after uh, final thoughts here. Okay. Um, Isra, did you want to finish your final thought? Um, I guess what I'm saying is that personally for me, I guess um, it's good that humans aren't immortal and that we haven't figured out how to remain immortal or how to, um, you know, extend our life past certain years because um, we wouldn't, as humans, in my perspective, if we have too much of a good thing, we stop valuing it. And so if there's, an, oh, there's always this aspect of, oh, it can be taken away from you, um, that aspect kind of is a motivator for many people to um, do what they want with their lives as is, instead of start worrying about things that they can potentially or not potentially control, given the fact that, oh, now that I'm immortal, I have this much spare time, I can focus my energies on uh, working or deconstructing so-and-so, you know? Because um, immort immortality does not guarantee a mature mind. It does not guarantee the fact that um, people would have a changed perspective or a changed personality uh, in a way that, you know, uh, so sometimes people, uh, even I personally, slip into this negative head spaces, which is really hard to come out of sometimes. So um, if you're immortal, that kind of becomes a um, state of mind for forever because you don't think that, oh, how long am I going to spend um, doing this or how long am I going to spend in this uh, headspace? I don't want to be like this anymore because I have much better things to do, you know? Well, I don't know if that kind of closed it, but for me personally speaking, I would say that immortality um, would be an aspect of exploration for humanity itself. And that brings up its own ethical and moral challenges, especially when it comes to a uh, human psyche and how each of us would believe that our immortality is best spent. So um, if you guys want to say your final thoughts, you mind raising your hand? I don't, uh, yeah, like on the screen by chance, like on the reaction yes. here. Yeah. <laughs> on the, yeah, on the reactions. And then we'll just go by the grid to who goes next. Okay. Nancy, you don't want to? Uh, I'll go last. I want to hear from everybody else. Okay, so we got, so Serena, Yusha, Fortuna, Ferdinando, are you going to want to? Sure. I can okay. go after Fortuna, I guess. Okay, I'm just trying to get, Marcus, are you going to? Uh, I don't really know what else to say, really. So, um, y'all, y'all say whatever you need to say. Okay. All right, well, B, Barakit, Yasmin, Muhammad, any of you guys? They'll, they'll indicate if they want to talk. Alrighty. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. So we're going to go by the grid here. And by my grid, Fortuna is 
the ones coming up here. Okay, I already know I kind of had a final thought already, but just one thing that I, I was thinking about um, was like, to a certain extent, I think we kind of are already at a point where we can kind of call ourselves immortal, right? Like lifespan of humans has definitely increased and with enough like money and power and influence, I definitely think that a person can like prolong their lives. Like Epicurus in, in you know, ancient Greek history died of a kidney stone and that probably wouldn't happen today with someone who had adequate um, health insurance. And I also think like before having discussions about immortality and how to prolong lives, we kind of need to save the lives that um, are dying of meaningless causes right now. Yeah. Ready? You should. Next. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You should. Uh, I guess my final thoughts would be, uh, is there, on the contrary, I would disagree that we did not reach uh, our goal. Uh, in my opinion, we did, because we did talk about it and in enough detail to reach the point where immortality seems unethical at this point, but up until the very point of immortality, everything is ethical. And I would 100% agree with uh, Ryan's point that eugenics, genetic modification, and all those sciences should be applied and researched with further, further detail, uh, not, not to empower anyone or not to uh, undermine anyone, but to help uh, eradicate the diseases that, that unfortunately happen and no one has control over them. Like he mentioned, uh, Down syndrome, uh, AIDS is one of them, cancer is one of them, and a lot of other genetic diseases or hered hereditary diseases that people get. All righty. Um, Serena, you're next. Um, okay, well, um, I guess I just feel like um, we are all scared of death on some level. So, you know, we do what we can with reasoning and science and in religion. And I guess all of it is mostly just kind of like the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine of death go down. I mean, <laughs> that is so well put. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, and I see where you're trying to get at eugenics, but I don't know. I'm torn. Like, you know, I do, everyone does want those debilitating diseases eradicated but you you're going to want to play more with gene therapy and altering genes than you are anything and i mean i mean down syndrome is unfortunate but i don't think there's anything wrong with those people they're still normal people they're just so mm -hmm. than we are and i mean that's all i really <laughs> have to say <laughs> all right let's try to be brief a little bit here because we've got 10 minutes um by the grid i'm going next um i think when it comes to science and ethics uh, I think in some ways they can overlap, in some ways they don't. I mean, in terms of ethics and morality, it seems like it's by circumstance that we come up with our morality. And so I feel like if the nature around us changes through science, then I, I think inevitably how we look at the world changes. And, uh, you know, if if we do reach immortality and death isn't seen as such, a, as such an evil or such a bad thing, then I think people will start to look at lives very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and in terms of immortality, uh, honestly, to even try to put it into words, to even try to give a perspective about how it would be to be immortal is, is impossible because I, once we're not in that, we're not in those shoes. You know, our mor morality now is very different from what it used to be back in the middle age, middle time, middle, medieval times. And, and so it seems like with progress comes the, comes this innovation. It comes these different ways of looking at life. So yeah, Ferdinando, you're next. That was good. That's great. Okay, so I'm next. Oh, and we have eight minutes. Nice. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, don't worry. I'm not going to take it. I know that we have to also set the topic, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I can talk for eight minutes. Um, okay, well, <laughs> regardless of, I, I do believe that I'm, I'm kind of sorry that today's topic, we only have one hour because it can, it can go really, I can, I can see myself talking like a whole night, maybe like with a wine here, like, oh, you know, this is so cool. All right, uh, we'll do it for one more hour. Let's keep it going. Yeah, let's, let's keep it going. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's how we roll in Venezuela. 
You just <laughs> go and take the whole night just to talk about philosophical stuff. You said, you said a little bit of wine, right? <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> bit of wine. I'm, I'm being <laughs> condescending here because it's not just wine. It's like rum. It gets crazy. But what? yeah, like the pirates, you know, rah, rah. <laughs> However, uh, I, do, I, I do like um, a lot of the points that some of people bring here, like in terms of religion. I would have loved to actually go more in depth of the ethical part, because I don't think we actually go too in, into it, like uh, what is really the limit, like when it's actually good to like push those ethics that Yusha was mentioning and what do we define ethics? Like, is it really like, we, how, like can we say like, do, do we dis- like we redefine our ethics through these unethical um, actions and stuff like that um, but I'm happy I guess as a final thought to have this place for us to kind of like expand our minds and talk a little bit more about what we already have in in us so kind of like we can build upon each other and that's, that's it awesome man beautiful <laughs> all right Manzi Last but not least. Uh, just one, yeah, let's make one point and then um, we'll settle on a topic. Uh, yeah, listen, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit of something about the, the ethics because, yeah, I, I agree that we didn't really talk about it explicitly, but it kept coming up, I think, in a lot of ways, maybe a bit more indirectly. So, so I'll put it like this. It's tough to not think of human beings as resources. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and here's more what I mean by that. Um, again, you think of things like, you know, we use examples earlier about like um, appendicitis or even something more like, you know, like I think I said a heart transplant, uh, blood transfusions, those things that help keep people alive are themselves now resources which you need to, to stay alive. So again, human organs, things like that, which require living human beings, at least on, at, at some point, um, they become, uh, again, uh, commodities on, on some level. Now, I think uh, it was Orlando, I think you said at the beginning you referenced cloning. We really didn't get around to that, but but uh, this idea of cloning, I, I think, you could say is morally justified, or morally unjustifiable in the following sense. It's morally justified because if you consider that human beings again need things like limbs and body parts from other human beings, well, if we can grow these other human beings in, in something like a lab, uh, well, then we have an endless supply of crops, so to speak. Um, and so that's morally justifiable, but, but of course, again, it's, it's morally unjustifiable if you consider things like, uh, again, you, you know, on the one hand, going back to religion, you know, you're supposed to be how God made you and die what God intended you to die. But, but even beyond that, it, it's more along the lines of, well, if, if we clone them with, with the kind of precision that science has afforded us, well, then don't they too now have rights and, and, and things like that. So that's where things can get a little tricky, maybe in a little science fictiony, but, but, but I think that, that might be something to consider. Again, everything is, is, is a, everything can be identified as a resource in terms of helping us avoid suffering and uh, allowing us to live on indefinitely. For the record, I totally get it if people, you know, don't want to live forever. It makes sense to me, even if it has nothing to do with religion. I mean, look, if I spend 20 minutes trying to learn something, I'm like, I get it. I get what this is about. If you've lived you know, years and years and years on this earth, I think you can say, I get it. And then you can make a decision. But, but having said that, um, I would certainly want to live forever. I don't, I, I can't imagine never not wanting that. So I, the only thing that would keep me from wanting that, I, I guess, would maybe be moral reasons. But if push comes to shove, <laughs> I, might, I might agree with Orlando and say, well, hey, maybe things have changed so we could change the morality. Um, okay, that, that's it. I, I, well, I mean, that's, that's a good point. And also, I think, I mean, like, I think science happens regardless of morality and ethics, because even when there's an ethical thought out there and there's a social norm, people still, there's always going to be some outliers and say, you know what, I still want to pursue this anyways. It's, yeah, well, you have to understand, science proved that if you, for example, abuse children, that they're going to suffer their whole lives for it. That's why it's wrong. So that's how science informs morality. That's how science informs the legality. It's things like that. Now, uh, again, it's, I don't mean the, the initial pain, but the psychological things that happen. I mean, this is, uh, I think they're, they're constantly sort of engaging in dialogue. This is why you can get all these huge grants and, and, and scholarships to publish papers on things like this because we're trying to sort of figure it out.
I don't want to be that guy, but we have three minutes. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, but you are. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to be that guy. But... So what do we got for topics then? Oh, geez. Uh, so the topics, I think you should put them down. Assisted suicide, human cloning, and true free will. I think those are definitely some interesting ones. Uh, <laughs> so I think we're just going to do it the same way we always have. You can go ahead and just put in the chat one, two, three. Um, so if you want to choose assisted suicide, oh wait, does anybody have any topic suggestions before we go, before we do it? Wasn't there one suggested already? I, I, I don't I think, think we have enough time to, to propose I think, something. I think yeah. the third topic should be true free will versus um, determinism. That's, I, was think, that's I, was thinking, I, I was thinking that too. Yeah, yeah. That's just kind of bothering me. <laughs> Honestly, I want that one. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to cheat. Uh, but anyways, so let's go ahead and put... <laughs> so if you want assisted suicide, uh, go ahead, type in one. Human cloning, two. True, true free will, three. Okay, so I think we have a clear winner. <laughs> Alrighty. So, awesome. okay. yeah, predeterminism versus free will is going to be the topic for next week. Same time, yeah. always, 3.30 p.m. So, All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Alrighty. Hi, right, y'all. Thanks Thank for coming. Uh, for a minute or so, Manzi, real quick. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Have a good one, y'all. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. 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 If you don't leave, I'm going to kick you out just so you guys know. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> it's okay, Scram. Jesus. Tyranny. Kick me out. Kick me out. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Last person here. Thanks okay. for coming, Jasmine. So, Isria um, just asked me. I thought it was interesting. She said, are, when are we choosing officers for next semester? The philosophy club? Oh, yeah. um, I don't know. <laughs> well, she was I saying mean, we, we've never we, we've never had a system in place. Like we've never had elections. You, I mean, you know this. Yeah, I know. She said she wants to be president. So, you know. she wants to be president of the philosophy club. That's what she said. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, usually, uh, if there's a president, we just let the president stay until the president steps down. Um, this guy. Because we we try to. Well, here's the thing. When it comes to like the president and the vice president, we we do try to have some continuity. 